Our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated fortitude for us to see. So if you're facing challenges today that seem insurmountable, stay tuned. We're going to fortify your faith as Arkansas Alive starts right now. All this week, we've been teaching on faith and fortitude. Faith is dead being alone. In the Bible, in 2 uh, Peter, it talks about adding to your faith. 2 Peter chapter 1. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. And it just goes down seven things that the Bible says we need to add to our faith. James said faith alone is dead. Faith has to have corresponding action. You might say it this way. You've gotten the measure of faith at the time of salvation. Jesus put that measure in you. But it's kind of like years ago, they used to have, you had regular oil, then you had additives. And you might say that it, it, God's faith is perfectly fine. I mean, it's, you can't improve on it. It's not any better. I mean, you can't get any better faith than God's faith when he puts that faith on the inside of you. But there are additives. You can fortify your faith by adding virtue, knowledge, temperance, etc. Well, faith and fortitude have to go together. Faith all by itself won't produce anything. What is fortitude? I gave you the definition earlier in the week. Fortitude, strength, courage, firmness in mind, facing danger and adversity, resolute, endurance, grit, backbone, guts, that's fortitude. When you add virtue or add fortitude to your faith, then you have a dynamic duo. You can do anything. And the reason I came up with this message is because the Holy Spirit impressed upon me after I was talking to Jeannie one day and we were sitting talking about her faith and she said, I'm a woman of fortitude. I have fortitude. She is. She's a virtuous woman. She has fortitude. And, and people still remark about her today as, as her fortitude, everything she has overcome all her life, all the challenges, the faith challenges. When she was uh, nine, ten years old, her father uh, was electrocuted putting up a TV antenna. TV had just come out and he owned an appliance store and he was installing a television, hit a live wire, killed him instantly. Nine years old, ten years old. She overcame that. Uh, she overcame the adversity. She overcame the pain. And then uh, after she and I got married and we started in the ministry, oh my goodness, the challenges, the adversity, uh, the opportunities to use our faith then in, in, in building the ministry, building our church uh, and paying for it as we went. Tremendous adversities, growing a congregation. And uh, then in uh, 1988 or 89, uh, we were just starting to build VTN and a big old tire truck hit us from the rear and broke her back in three places. She overcame that, came out totally well. And then uh, two years ago, uh, they discovered a brain tumor and she, the Lord told her to go have it removed. It was a miracle just to have it removed. It was supernatural. The, the surgeon said not many people uh, surgeons could have done what I just did. Well, we told him ahead of time God was going to help him. He, he agreed. He said, I'm the doctor, but he's the healer. Supernatural. They told her she'd have to learn to walk and talk again. She did. And just a few weeks ago in Israel, I mean, tell you, she was up in those mountains. She was climbing here, climbing there, going there. I mean, everything has been restored. She is a virtuous woman. She is a woman of faith and fortitude. So how do you get fortitude? Because <laughs> some of you are thinking, okay, I need fortitude. That's what I need. I need fortitude. You have to add that to your faith. The Bible definition is virtue. Add to your faith virtue. <clears throat> Abraham, the father of our faith, he demonstrates fortitude and faith. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. His body was old. 
he couldn't reproduce a child, but God told him he'd be the father of nations. So he knew that it was going to have to come from God supernaturally. He stepped out in faith. It says he was strong in faith, not being weak in faith. Weak faith just sits there and does nothing. Strong faith confesses, calls things that are not as though they were. Well, let's look at Jesus. Today, Jesus demonstrates fortitude for us. Now, you might say, yeah, but, but Pastor Caldwell, Jesus was the Son of God. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. The Bible teaches that he was as much a man as if he were not the Son of God. We know he was both. We know that he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. Yet he took upon himself humanity. So Jesus didn't think that it was wrong or robbery, didn't take away from his deity to become humanity. He was both deity and humanity. And according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, God has made us partakers of his divine nature. We're not deity in that we're God, but we have his nature on the inside of us. So we have both God's divine nature and humanity. And the Bible is very clear over and over. It says that God did not leave us powerless. He empowered us with his spirit, his ability to do greater things. Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because you go to the Father. The reason we're not seeing Christians, believers doing greater works is because, first of all, they don't believe they can and they don't know how. Uh, Roger Bannister, 1954, broke the four-minute mile. First athlete to run a mile in less than four minutes. How did he do it? Well, first of all, he had to, he had to believe that he could. But in 1954, a mile in four minutes was a Mount Everest to runners. I mean, nobody had ever done it. They didn't think it could be done. But Roger Bannister, who was a medical student at the time, he, he lives in Oxford, England today, and he was going to challenge this. He was going to be determined, fortitude. He was going to prove that a man could run a mile in less than four minutes. And he did it. That took faith. It took fortitude. <clears throat> Jesus demonstrated this to us in the Bible. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and let's look at verse 1. And I'm, I'm going to say this by the Spirit of God to somebody you're, you're sitting there watching me right now. You have the faith to do what God's called you to do. You just haven't gotten up and done it. You, you're, you need to add fortitude to your faith. And you'll see, once you add fortitude, it's all going to work. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. He's our model. He's our example. Looking unto Jesus. Now he's going to tell us what Jesus did. Jesus is demonstrating faith and fortitude. People think Jesus did whatever he did just because he's the son of God. No, he was the son of man as well as the son of God. And if, and if Jesus did everything that he did just because he was the son of God, then what about us? Poor old us. He said we could do greater works. So if he did it just because he was the son of God, then that leaves us out totally in the cold. We can't, we can't uh, do the things that he said if he just did them because he was the son of God. But the Bible teaches that Jesus was a man anointed with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Jesus himself said, I am anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. So yes, Jesus is the son of God. Yes, he was the son of God. Yes, he's the son of man. But he didn't do what he did in the Bible because he was the son of God, he did it because he was a man anointed with the spirit of God. He said that, Luke 4. 
He has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has anointed me to heal the sick. He has anointed me to cast out devils. And he's anointed you and me to do the same thing. Let, let's, let's go on reading here. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, fo follow these words very carefully. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So he said, take a look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He's our example. He's our model. Look at Jesus. Keep in mind, all of the heroes, the Hall of Fame of Faith, all those that have gone uh, before us, the great cloud of witnesses, did you know that there is a difference between honor and patronization? I think sometimes our young ministers don't realize the difference. Honor is one thing. To patronize somebody else is another. Patronization is not God. It's not biblical. You patronize somebody, you do them an injustice. But to honor them is to place them in that position, just like these great cloud of witnesses <laughs> that have gone on before us. Everybody that's gone on before us deserves our honor. You, you, don't, you don't patronize them. You honor them. And if you don't understand the difference, just go to the scriptures and, and see what the Bible says. Romans 13 says to honor those that are before you. We honor those. To honor them means to, to place them in a place of esteem. But the reason you people have a hard time honoring somebody else is because of pride, immaturity, arrogance. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're too busy trying to make their own mark. They can't admit or acknowledge somebody else's accomplishments and marks because they feel like that takes away from their own. And the worst case scenario is they're, around, they're out to erase the memory of those that have preceded them so they can take the preeminence. That is not honor. Honor does not try to disassemble anything that anybody's done ahead of you. It doesn't mean that you're going to take apart what they've done or take their picture off the wall so nobody will remember them. That's not honor. You patronize sometimes by the things you say, but you don't really honor them in your heart. Well, that was a side trip there. Somebody might have needed that. Okay, so Jesus' example is that he demonstrated fortitude for us to see. Now, it says he endured the cross. It said he despised the shame, but he endured it. That took fortitude. I don't, I don't know that the word fortitude even gives half of the consideration that it should give to what Jesus did. I mean, the Bible says that he was naked before his accusers. He was humiliated for nothing that he did. He did all this for you and me. He did, he did this for the body of Christ, whosoever would believe upon him. He didn't deserve. He was not a sinner. He never sinned. He wasn't doing this because of anything that he had done. He was doing this for me and you. We're the ones that needed it. So that took fortitude to let them beat him and stripe him, whip him, jam a crown of thorns on his head, slap, spit in his face, pull out his beard, nail him to a cross, hang him up there to die. <laughs> you better believe it. I don't think fortitude is a strong enough word. Let's go over to Isaiah 50 and let's look at a prophetic messianic reference to Jesus. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters. 
my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. That's fortitude, my brothers and sisters. Listen to this again. I will not be confounded. I have set my face like a flint, hard, and I know I shall not be ashamed. Faith and fortitude, they go together. Jesus demonstrated this to us. Of course, he, he's the prime model example of fortitude. He set his face like flint. Now, now let me show you in the New Testament over here what, what uh, Peter tried to do. And I, I, I give Peter the, you know, benefit of the doubt. I don't think he had revelation of what he was doing. He just loved Jesus and he was concerned about him and, and he knew what was, he was going to face. And he, he was just trying to protect him. But listen to this. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 21. Now, this is after Jesus had uh, told Peter, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loosed in heaven. He gave him the, the, the revelation of the kingdom and how it works. And look at verse 21. Matthew 16, 21. From that time... Jesus began, or from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed <laughs> and be raised again the third day. Now in Isaiah, the, the messianic prophetic utterance about this day said, he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. Well, now here he is in Jerusalem and he's telling Peter, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be raised the third day. Now listen to what Peter says. <laughs> then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me. You savoreth not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Whoa. I can only imagine what Peter must have felt like. How would you like your Lord and Master, whom you dearly love, to rebuke you and say, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. He, he, Jesus wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was addressing the word, the statement, the thought. You, you know why in Isaiah, it, it said, Isaiah 50 and verse 7, it said, he set his face like flint, unmoved, determined, that was fortitude. R listen to it again. Strong, firmness in mind, facing danger or adversity. We're going to find out that Paul followed this model too. Resolute, endurance, grit, backbone, guts. So you could say it this way. Jesus had guts. Jesus had grit. And Paul's epistle, he writes and, and says, I know or I don't know the things that befall me going to Jerusalem. But he said, I'm going anyway. Jesus didn't know everything that he was going to face because on the cross, when God forsook him because he became our sin substitute, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He just didn't know the whole plan at that particular time. He knew God was going to be with him and he could do anything if God was with him. But notice, Jesus 
rebuked Peter and said, um, I rebuke you, Satan. Get behind me. I imagine Peter just wanted to weep and wilt away because he, he thought my Lord doesn't think I love him or care for him. He said, I'm just trying to protect him. But Jesus' fortitude would not allow him to turn away. Look at this again. He said, you are an offense unto me. Why? You're, you're an offense because God has told me this. God has revealed this to me. And you're trying to tell me something else. There will be people, now, uh, Oral Roberts told this to Kenneth Copeland one time. Brother Copeland used to be Oral Roberts' pilot and driver when he was attending ORU as a student. You may have heard him say this. And he used to go pick Brother Roberts up, take him to the crusade. And he was told never to talk to Brother Roberts as he was driving him to the crusade because Brother Roberts would be praying in the Spirit and preparing himself for the big tent crusades. And, and Brother Copeland said, I didn't say a word to him. He said, you could be fired. You could lose your job for talking in those, in those days, in those times. And so he said, one day, Brother Roberts turned to him and said, Kenneth, people will tell you how to fail. And then turn back around. That was it. I, I had Brother Roberts do me that way one time. He was always doing something like that to somebody. He came up to me one day and said, Happy, what would you rather have, justice or mercy? And then he turned around and walked off. I knew the right answer. The right answer was mercy. But sometimes you want to have justice. You want to see and, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But Brother Roberts told Brother Copeland, he said, people will tell you how to fail. Now, here's an example of that. Here is Peter, uh, here is Jesus going to, to suffer on the cross, be our sin substitute. He's going to die and give his life for the ransom of many sons. And here is Peter who, who had foot in mouth disease, always putting his foot in his mouth, saying things he shouldn't say. And here's Peter genuinely concerned and caring and loving about Jesus. But he says, oh, no, don't, don't, don't go up there, Master. He said, Master, uh, this shall not be unto you. He rebuked the Lord. He rebuked Jesus. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter. He was talking to that demon spirit, doubt, fear, unbelief. Now, you got to remember this. Jesus was all God, but he was all man. He was the God man. He was deity, but he was humanity. And at that particular time, his, his deity had to override his humanity because in the natural, humanity did not want to be crucified. So that's why he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He knew what he had to do. And when Peter said, be it far from you, not unto you, then that was a that was a, a demonic move through Peter to try and get Jesus discouraged. Could Jesus have decided not to go to the cross? Yes. He could have decided. He could have backed out of the whole thing. That's what the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane was all about. That's why it says he sweated great drops as it were blood. He struggled. It says that over in Hebrews. We just read it. It says, you have not resisted unto blood. Jesus resisted in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Prayer, unto blood. Blood came out of his pores. Medical doctors have said his capillaries ruptured because of stress and pressure. And blood came out of the pores of his skin. Man, he was striving with all of his spirit, his might, and putting the flesh down. He, he had intestinal fortitude, as we say. <laughs> It, regardless of what the circumstances showed. Of course, it goes without saying he had faith. He had faith and fortitude. So when Peter said to him, not so, Lord, it, 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 was, a, it was a challenge to Jesus' faith and his fortitude kicked in. He said, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to the cross and there's not one thing you can do about it. 
Now you have to take that attitude when you walk by faith. As long as you know that you know that you know. Now if you're just playing around, pride, arrogance, uh, mental ascent, you're going to wind up with egg on your face. You're going to have to be man or woman enough to stand up and apologize and say, I missed it. But if you know it's God, you know God has told you, you know God has ministered to you, you know God has given you this, then you have to add fortitude to your faith and go for it. Okay. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 20. We're running out of time. We'll pick this up tomorrow tomorrow but I want to at least get started. Now, here is the Apostle Paul, because tomorrow we're going to, I'm going to pray for you, uh, according to the Bible, to help you with your faith and fortitude. But, but let's look at the Apostle Paul here. Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. Now, we'll read this again tomorrow, but look at this. Now, here's the Apostle Paul. He's following Jesus' example. Of course, you know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So we know he was following Jesus' example. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. Same, same thing that Jesus did in Isaiah 57, the Messianic uh, uh, prophetic messianic instruction where it said and Jesus set his face like flint through the prophet Isaiah different language but the same situation Paul said I go bound in the spirit Jesus said I set my face like flint Paul said I go bound in the spirit in other words what, what the Holy Spirit is leading me guiding me directing me to do I will do that's my fortitude added to my faith. Behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Now we'll pick this up here tomorrow. Be sure and join me. VTN's on Facebook. You can find us at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. You can also follow me on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. And this episode is available to watch if you missed it or want to watch it again online. Log on to vtntv.com and click on Watch On Demand. VTN is available to watch 24-7 via live stream wherever you live, wherever you're watching. We have people watching all over the world. Jeannie and I were in Israel a few weeks ago. We watched it every day in Jerusalem. Isn't that awesome? That's a miracle of God. Call friends and neighbors and tell them to watch. And don't forget, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever you're watching. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.